the opposite party was the enemy, and if they are going to try to kill you, you have to defend, you have to fight. So in the same fashion, the Quran mentions that when these unbelievers come to attack you, come to kill you, don't get scared, fight them. And if necessary, kill them, in context. Only those people who are fighting against you, not innocent people. So please don't quote out of context, please don't misquote. Regarding the last type of freedom of expression, that you can blame anyone, you can criticize anyone with solid facts. Again, they are subdivided into two types. Some facts are meant to be secret, some are not secret. Suppose a government official working in the American government, he tells all the details of the American Army, of the American Navy, of the American Air Force to the enemy. He is speaking the truth, mind you, with proof he is giving you, with photocopies, with photographs, with blueprints, all the secrets of the American government. Do you think the American government will give that person an award? If someone does that to send to the Indian government, do you think the Indian government will give that traitor an award? Will it give a, that person a Bharat Ratna? Surely not. It will hold him on trial and punish him. So such type of truths which are meant to be secret, if revealed, Quran is against. He is called a munafik, a hypocrite. Come to the last type. That can you speak against, can you defame, can you criticize with proof, which is not a secret. Example, a government official in America speaks against the corruption of the government in America. Quran gives them full right. Quran encourages such truth to be told in public against falsehood. Such truth, Quran always agrees. And I started my lecture with ayat from the Quran. I'd like to end it with the same, which says, وَقُلْ جَعَلْ حَقْوَ ذَاكَ الْبَاطِلْ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ وَنَزْلُ مِنَ الْقُرآنِ مَا هُوَ الشَّفَا وَرَحْمَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارَةً Which means, when truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. The Quran was revealed in stages and it's a mercy and healing for the believers. As, as for the people of untruth, it is nothing but loss after loss. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Uh, that was quite a provocative speech, provocative in a very positive manner. It, it uh, sets us thinking. And our last speaker is Mr. Ashok Sahani, who is the translator of Lajja into Marathi. Dr. Uh, Mr. Sahani, please. Well, friends, apparently the problem seems to be that every religion has a book. And we, living in the fag end of the 20th century, will not be satisfied with the book that was written maybe 1,500 years back or 2,000 years back or 5,000 years back, as Dr. Vyas may claim, um, the holy ancient times for when the, when the Vedas were compiled. So one would not be, um, one, would, um, one would be a bit puzzled if the last word had been said some 5,000 years back or 1,500 years back. I mean, of course, the journalists will not agree with this because they have to bring out the issue every day. They are the dealers in words. So, I mean, it's difficult for a journalist, it's almost impossible for a journalist to, to, to conceal that the last word has already been said. Then, but if the last word has already been said, what's he doing? What's he busy with? What's he writing? Now, to come to the point, Salman Rajdi had in an article written long time back, I mean, before he wrote, uh, the Satnic verses, has stated that the politicians and the writers are in enemy camps because they fight over the same territory. 
the territory is reality the politicians would like the reality to be shown in a certain perspective certain single perspective at the expense of all other perspectives possible perspectives that as a literary person an author would like the reality to be presented in as from as many angles as possible so the fight is between a certain official perspective and the possible unofficial perspective now you may say that i mean this has been said about uh, the politicians it has nothing to do with the r- 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 religious fundamentalists but the politicians are just a shade lesser than the religious fundamentalists you know they have their own ideology and if they stick to their ideology if they take the word of the ideology as the last word then they are as bad or as uh, or, or worse than the fundamentalists we have the examples in soviet russia a lot of examples for them but now if the journalists think that they are the dealers of the words the supreme dealers of the words in today's world then this episode of tasliman nasreen is a pointer that the word doesn't belong to the journalist the word belongs to the poet as the poets from all times have claimed that the word belongs to them the word does not belong to the legislators the word does not belong to the um founders of religions the word belongs to the poet and so the conflict has arisen when the calcutta newspaper statesman sent a correspondent to tasliman nasreen in his sojourn in calcutta on a way back to dhaka from paris and interviewed her the poor journalist did not know the difference between quran and sharia so taslima was quoted wrongly taslima protested against it and the letter was printed and the possibly the statesman people thought that as good democratic um, gentlemen i mean we have settled the issue but not so less than a month afterwards the people in a country as for the as for the for the blood of taslima and the reason given is the interview that was published in the station i had imagined that the indian newspapers will have the sincerity to say we are sorry if somebody's life has been put into peril because of what a certain newspaper published wrongly and it's um, well freedom of expression also means that you have the freedom to say you are sorry it's not like um, um, you you are always in the right you may not be always in the right but that's not been done and i think we have to think seriously suppose for instance for uh, whatever reasons the slima loses her life her blood would be on the head of an indian newspaper and so also with the on the on the head of the fundamentalist but also on the head of an indian newspaper now you have to decide which one or who are the blocks who are blocking the freedom of expression the newspapers the fundamentalist or together both of them for an unofficial practitioner of words the poet the newspapers and the fundamentalists the the, the largely circulated uh, newspapers and the largely followed religions may not make much difference there may not be much difference between them that's all
Pakistani. We can now have the question and answer session. Uh, there are a couple of rules to be observed. The speakers will have to stand up, identify themselves, and give the name of their publication. Because I expect a fusillade of questions, I think it should be one question per person. The, the question preferably should be directed to one particular speaker. And as I, as I mentioned before, please be brief and do not try to give the answer to your own question. Uh, that should be left to the four eminent gentlemen who, who, who enlightened us to a great detail. So, fire away. Yeah. My name is Javed and I am not from any publication. I just happened to read your advertisement in Times of India and I thought I will spend a good afternoon here. In any case, my question is directed to Mr. Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, but before that, uh, let me, I, uh, I want to clarify a point said by Mr. Sahani, who said that uh, Taslima has been quoted wrongly. In any case, if you could uh, see the 31st January 94 Time magazine issue reported by Mr. Fazan Ahmad, there she has said that uh, the sun revolves around the earth. Okay. And, uh, I mean, how can we believe such unscientific thing if it is in the Quran? And secondly, she has said, is, she has blamed Islam for the <coughs> high rate of female infanticide in Bangladesh. I mean, I, I think these are... Is it in the Quran? Can you clarify? Brother Javed has posed me two questions. It depends upon the chairperson whether he allowed me to answer both or not. I will, I will answer the... He has the beginner's luck, so he, he has asked two questions. In, in future it won't be permitted, only one question. Okay. The first question he said was in the Time magazine, which happens to be one of the most authentic magazine in the world, one of the most authentic magazine. I do agree it was reported on the 31st of January that she said that Quran mentions that the sun revolves around the earth and if we believe in such teachings, how can we progress? I do agree with the second statement. If we believe in such statements, how will we progress? But regarding the first part of the allegation, that the Quran mentions that the sun revolves around the earth, I want proof. Let a producer proof. Where does the Quran say that? What she is referring to, brother, is mainly a verse in the Quran. In Surah al anbiya chapter number 21, verse number 33, which says, that it is Allah who has created the night and the day, the sun and the moon, each one traveling in its own orbit. The same thing is repeated in Surah Yaseen, chapter number 36, verse number 40. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Quran does not say that the sun revolves around the earth. The Quran says the sun and the moon, each one traveling in its own orbit. The Arabic word used is yasbaha, coming from the root word sabaha, describing the motion of a moving body. If you say a man is doing sabaha on the floor, it means he is not standing, it means he is walking or running. If you say a man is doing sabaha in water, it does not mean he is floating, it means he is swimming. Same way if you use the word sabaha for a heavenly body, it means rotating about its own axis. So the Quran mentions, the sun and the moon rotate, they travel in a motion that they revolve and they rotate about its own axis. Now again, this verse had put me a little bit doubts because I had passed my SSC, I had passed my ICSE, sorry, in 1982 from St. Peter's School. And there in geography I learned that the sun did not rotate. The sun revolved, fine, but it was stationary. It did not rotate about its axis. And the Quran mentioned that the sun rotates about its axis. So I was a bit worried. And then I had to do a little bit of research. And then I came to know that according to the recent advances in science and astronomy, we come to know that even the sun rotate, rotates about its axis. And to prove it, you can take equipment in the laboratory, and since you can't look at the sun directly, the image of the sun can be put on a tabletop. And the sun has got certain holes, like black spots. And that black spot take about 25 days to rotate completely. So in short, the sun takes about 25 days to rotate. So the Quran is not backward, it is more up to date. 
I want to ask the Sriman Asreen that who could have written this 1400 years ago that the sun and the moon was Shams or Kamar, Kulvan Fi Falakan Yas Baun, that the sun and the moon each one travel in its own orbit, means revolving and rotating. Ask her. The Quran does not mention at all that the sun rotates or revolves around the earth. That's a misinterpretation. Since the chairman has given me permission regarding the second part of the question, and she has alleged that it is because of Islam that there is such a high rate of infanticide, female infanticide in Bangladesh. She alleged that. I want her to tell me, quote me one verse of the Quran which says that you should kill female children. In fact, according to the BBC report, in the program assignment, the title of that small clipping was Let Her Die. And um, a British reporter, Emily Beckinen, she came from America and she did a survey on female infanticides. And India happens to have the maximum number. And according to her, according to her, every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted or being identified that they are females. 3,000 fetuses in our mother country. And if you multiply this by 365, more than 1 million fetuses are being recognized that their female are being aborted. Why don't you read it in the headlines, in our papers? Let the papers give it on the front page every day until this female infanticide is stopped. And according to the Tamil Nadu government report, out of the live births of female children, out of 10, 4 are put to death. 4 are put to death. It had to be a Britisher to come and tell us Indians what's the rate of female infanticide in our country. Now coming to the point, what does Quran speak about female infanticide? She cannot quote any verse. I challenge her to quote any verse from the Quran which says female children should be put to death. In fact, if you read Surah Taqweer, see I'm going with quotation. Sassin Manasreen only says Quran says that, Quran says this. How can a layman who does not, who has not read the Quran, or even if he has read the Quran, where will he find which verse says this, what she's saying? So, you have to take it for granted. Give benefit of doubt that the Quran does say that the sun rotates around the earth, or you have to agree that it believes in female infanticide. If you read the Quran in Surah Taqweer, chapter number 81, verse number 8 and 9, it says that when the female child, when she's buried alive, and when she cries out, for what crime has she been killed? On the day of judgment, she'll cry out for what crime she has been killed. So female infanticide has been completely forbidden in Islam. In fact, all sorts of female infanticides and killing of children has been prohibited. It's mentioned in Quran, in Surah Al-Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31, as well as in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 51, which says, Kill not a children for want of sustenance. It is Allah who will provide you and your children for sustenance. In fact, Quran rebukes the thought of a person rejoicing on the birth of a male child and his faith being sad on the birth of a female child. It's mentioned in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 58 and 59. Hope that answers the question, brother. Uh, uh, Father Pereira wants to say something on this particular issue. I just want to make a general comment which I think is important at this stage. You often hear People say, oh, the Quran says this, which is an obscurantist thing. Oh, Hinduism says that, which is against progress. Oh, you can prove these things from the Bible and so on. Be very careful, firstly, when you hear things. A. Often these are vague statements made, as Dr. Naik has pointed very clearly, which have no reference at all. That's the first thing. Secondly, often uh, religious uh, scriptures are used by politicians and are used by obscurantists hmm, to support their own prejudices. Classic instance of racism and the Bible. You know that a lot of Western Christianity through the century has been racist and they have used the Bible to defend it. It's absolutely false, but here it is politics which comes to use religion for its own purposes. Remember what I said at the beginning, every religion has a liberative element which can emancipate you, but can also oppress you, depending on how these things have been twisted. 
So I make this general comment because often you hear statements like this and then they will blame, okay, Muslims, see, Muslims, what else? See, or Christians, of course, you're Christians, or Hindus like this, or Sikhs, whatever. Be very careful because this is the typical kind of prejudice, actually, which only, uh, as well, creates turbulence and does not help to clear any doubts. More questions? Settled up from communism, come back Dr. Zaki Nayak. Wanted to ask him whether he considers the attack on Dr. Bedar for saying that uh, Hindus are not uh, Kafirs but Murtads by he was threatened with his life. Was that a fundamentalist attack on his life and freedom of expression or not? Please report the question. Please repeat the question. Dr. Veda. Dr. Bedar. Dr. Dr. Bedar of the Khudabaksh Library was threatened with his life. His freedom of expression curved when he said that Hindus are not Kafirs but Murtad. Sister has posed the question that so the person, Mr. Bedar, who said that Hindus are not Kafirs and they are Murtads. Therefore, is it right that the fundamentalist that threatened his life, is that a curb of freedom of expression or not? and life. Again, two, three questions. Regarding the first part, that whatever that Mr. Bedar said, that Hindus are not Kafirs, but they are Murtads, does not have any base, because he may not be well versed in the Arabic language. What is the meaning of Kafir? I told you that Kafir means the person who conceals the truth or rejects the truth. It does not, it does not mean that a Kafir has to be a Hindu. He can be a Hindu, he may not be a Hindu. I will come to the complete answer. So, only if I justify the meaning can I justify my answer, sister. If I don't justify the meaning, my answer will have no relevance. Because Quran always says, Kul hatu burhanakum, produce your proof. While giving your answer, give your proof. Without proof, I don't give comments. So, firstly, Kafir does not mean a Hindu. It may be a Hindu, may not be a Hindu. And what is the meaning of Murtad? Murtad is a Muslim who, after he has accepted the faith, he converts to another faith. That's called a murtad. So, Mr. Bedar's explanation has got no relevance at all. Neither is it correct literally. It does not have neither a head nor a tail. Regarding whether those Muslim people, first, were they fundamentalists or not, I don't know. Were they right in putting a death sentence? I would say without proof, no one has the right to put a death sentence. If they had if they gave an opportunity to clarify himself, and if he falters, or, or if he had abused the Quran, then it's a different question. If he was not able to clarify, depending upon what proof did Dr. Bedar give to the Muslim students. Otherwise, otherwise I would say that without any proof, if those Muslims have called for his death, it is completely wrong. It's against Islam. Hope that answers the question, sister. Fine, fine, you can ask me a question. I thought my answer was over. The second question, I give a second answer. If it's based on truth, does a person have a right to pass a death sentence? It is like you asking me if the Indian government has proof that a person who has told the secrets of the country, of the army, of the navy, of the air force, has told to somebody else. And if he's caught and he's proved that he actually betrayed the country, the Indian government will punish with proof. Same way, if there is proof that he has betrayed or spoken something wrong, if there is proof, then I feel he requires punishment. Hope that answers the question. That, that's the second part of the question. Is a death sentence, or if it's a first part, no problem. Can you give death sentence? See, every crime, every crime, the punishment given are various. Like, for example, if you read in the trains, if you pull the chain without any reason, 500 rupees fine or and three months imprisonment. So if you are caught, one judge may give you 500 fine, the other judge may give you 500 fine and one month. Some judge may give you only three months, some judge may give you both. The, the punishment differs from each judge to each judge. Regarding what does religious fundamentalism talk about if someone blasphemes 
We haven't used that word, but I'm using it. Someone blasphemes. What does the Quran say? I quote the Quran. The Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 33 states that the punishment for anyone who wages war against Allah, like against God Almighty, and His Messenger, or strives, does jihad, strives with might and main, with might and vain, to create mischief in the land. His punishment is either execution or crucifixion or chopping off of limbs of the opposite side or exile. This is the law given in one verse of the Quran. Other verses say that if possible, you speak with Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mawizat al hasna wajadillum billati ya ahsan. It is said in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and debate with them and reason with them in ways that are best and most gracious. If you ask me, what would I do to Tasreem Nasreen? Since Quran gives so many options, I would say I would call off for a public debate. That's what, that depends upon the judge. The, the punishment may differ on every judge. Every punishment, if enough proof is given, if you read, since you ask, the topic is religious fundamentalism, if you refer to the Bible, the Bible says, and Father can correct me if I'm wrong, in the third book of the Old Testament, in Leviticus, chapter number 24, verse number 16, it states that anyone, any person who blasphemeth the name of thy Lord, he should certainly be put to death. Certainly be put to death. And the congregation. Father, if you want the Bible, the Bible is available here. If you think I'm misquoting, I'm quoting verbatim. Father, from whichever version you want, with the King James Version or the New Way Version. I'd, I'd like to complete the quotation. If you're a fundamentalist Christian, you have to follow the Bible. The Bible says in Leviticus, chapter number 24, Verse number 16, that anyone who blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall certainly be put to death. And all the congregation shall surely stone him, even the stranger. For anyone who is born in the land and blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. So if you are a good Christian, what does the Bible say? Anyone who blasphemeth the Lord, he should be put to death. There may be other options also given in the Bible, but this is one of them. an important point, so let me give you an, a slightly different point of view. There's such a thing in the world as mob justice or rough justice or lynching. You're familiar with these terms. In the United States, for example, for many years, even until very recently, if you were a black, uh, a group of white men could just say, he tried to rape my daughter, and they would lynch you on the spot. So in the same way, please realize that there's such a thing as rough justice, and a lot of this is taking place in sometimes in Islamic countries. I have here a report on, uh, which comes in from Pakistan, and the title is, Blasphemy Laws Are So Vague That Anyone Can Be Murdered. I can give this to anyone if you want to make Xerox copies of it. It's unfortunate. Probably the only country in the Muslim world right now that has enough of ulema to handle these cases against the Sharia is Iran. That's why you never hear cases of this in Iran. But many other instances where you appeal to the Sharia or you appeal against uh, uh, to an inter interpretation of the Quran and you find invariably that Maulana are too much too politicized and a lot of this thing comes from politics. So therefore to say that Islam is responsible again is wrong. You've got to see the political context of a country like Bangladesh for example, like Pakistan for example. Uh, like uh, Algeria, for example, the Islamic Salvation Front, and other places like this. So this is very important to keep in mind. The instances of Dr. Bailar, etc., is what you'd call mob justice. I don't like you, you block him, come out, I'll kill you. And this is what they do, you're killed. Who has the right to execute? Only the state, after a due process of trial. The trouble is, in many countries, the democratic process is so weak, and we find this so in Bangladesh today, there's a fighting going on between the Prime Minister and the other opposition uh, leader, between Zia and Hasina. And this is one reason why these things are taking place. Now they're coming out and say, no, no, don't ever threaten the woman, otherwise be careful. Note that the Maulana who has put that, uh, that reward of uh, 50,000 takas has not yet been arrested. There are three persons who have put uh, rewards upon the head of, uh, of Taslim, but there's only the 
public notification has gone out that action can be taken, but no one has taken action yet. You see, many of these things do happen. Eh? And recently you had a case, uh, probably you picked up in the papers, uh, an Ayatollah Khomeini, I think, said that one Ayatollah can uh, issue a fatwa which negates the previous fatwa. Why is it taking such a long time to say this? Huh? Why is it taking such a long time? Politics, you know from your own st study of the whole Salman Rushdie case that the reason why Ayatollah Khomeini issued that fatwa was entirely political. You know it. So don't make Islam a scapegoat for the tricks of politicians. Don't make that. Christians have done this, plenty of examples of that. Hindus have done this, plenty of examples of that. Muslims are doing this, plenty of examples. Sikhs have done it, all right. You always have this kind of continual tension between religion and politics and one will use the other. I'll give you plenty of examples from Christianity if you are patient to wait the evening. Plenty of examples. You see? So it's important to keep these two things in mind. Rough justice, one thing, and you, there's no way in which we can excuse this kind of thing. But unfortunately, governments are too weak to enforce it, and that's why you have what you have. Mr. Wagle. Dr. Nayak ne debating skills to bahut sare dikhaye hai. Main unse ha ya na ha me jawab chahta hu. Taslima ke khilaf jin logo ne fatwa issue kiya. उस अमानवी फतवे का आप समर्थन करते हैं या निषेध करते हैं फंडामेंटलिस्ट and islam my fundamentals of islam do not allow me to give the answer in one word do not allow me that's right and then you have no answer because i i will have to call her in the court of law and after i have examined her after i have integrated her and after she is given an equal opportunity to support herself after she has been given an equal opportunity to support herself can the death sentence be passed otherwise no i have not met her i have not met her if you have contact with her in front of me i can't Islam does not give me the permission brother Thank you very much Thank you uh, I'm not exactly a full time journalist but uh, Dr Naik do you think the people who have uh, given this punishment announce pronounce whatever have given her that opportunity Brother has asked a question that have those people who have passed the death sentence have they given her opportunity to clarify herself i don't know i don't know believe me i don't know maybe may not be i don't know i read in the papers the news keep on altering no see i'm speaking the truth how can i how do i know i don't know personally i read in the papers in one paper it mentions she's 29 years old one paper she's 31 one paper says 39 one paper says she's a plain mbbs doctor the other paper says she's a gynecologist the other paper says anesthetist you ask me what is she i say i don't know dr nayak se hue inse puchna chahta hu ki inhone hindu dharm ke bare mein bahut sari baatein kahi sanatan hindu dharm ke bare mein और हिंदू धर्म में रिफॉर्म्स हुए क्योंकि हिंदू धर्म बड़ा हिंदू धर्म का सनातन हिंदू धर्म का मन बड़े उदार बड़ा उदार था इसे उन्होंने कहा मुझे उनसे इतना ही पूछना है कि जो चारवास से लेकर खुले आगर कर तक सारे रिफॉर्मिस्ट हुए उन्हें जो तकलीफें झेलने पड़ी वो हिंदू धर्म के उदार मन की निशानी है या नहीं चारवाग से कहां तक अभी आज तक भी लीजिए आप इसका सीधा उत्तर यह है मैंने पहले अपने वक्तव्य में कह दिया था कि वैचारिक विरोध के आधार पर शारीरिक कष्ट किसी को दिया जाए इसका पहला उदाहरण गांधी हत्या का है चारवाक को हम लोग बृहस्पति का अवतार मानते हैं सावित्री भाई फुले पर भी पत्थर फेंके गए थे गांधी हत्या पहला उदाहरण नहीं है शंभुक का भी पहले उदाहरण है आगर घर की तो शव यात्रा निकाली गई थी देखिए ये सारे उदाहरण अंग्रेजी शिक्षा के आने के बाद के हैं इसलिए इन सब की जिम्मेदारी मैं अंग्रेजी शिक्षा को मानता हूं एक शंभुक का उदाहरण आप छोड़ दीजिए एक शंभुक का उदाहरण आप छोड़ दीजिए मैंने कहा वैचारिक विरोध के आधार पर 
वैचारिक विवक्ता जहां तक चारवाक का आपने नाम लिया आप इतिहास में कहीं नहीं बता सकते हैं टॉर्चर तो हर रिफॉर्मिस्ट को किया गया है आप मुझे बताइए चारवाक पर कौन से अत्याचार है और आप किस इतिहास के आधार पर शंभू के बारे में थोड़ा सा एक्सप्लेनेशन दीजिए पहले आप चारवाक को वापस ले लीजिए हर रिफॉर्मिस्ट को फिजिकल टॉर्चर किया गया है आज तक जो जहां तक मैं अयोध्या तक बोलता हूं कि अयोध्या के बारे में बात करने वाले जो लोग हैं और हिंदू धर्म में जो खराब नीतियां हैं या खराब अंधश्रद्धा है उनके खिलाफ बोलने वाले आज के जो आज तक के नए नौजवान हैं अंधश्रद्धा निर्मूलन समिति के उनको भी फिजिकल टॉर्चर का सामना करना पड़ा है यही मैं आपको कहता हूं क्योंकि ये आपकी बात सच नहीं है कि रिफॉर्म इसको कोई तकलीफ नहीं दी गई और सिर्फ डिबेट चलाया गया या डायलॉग चलाया गया फिजिकल टॉर्चर तो हुआ ही है और इसके तो इतने सारे उदाहरण हैं आप इतिहास पढ़ के वो दूर आप, निकाल सकते हैं आपने चारवाक से प्रारंभ किया मेरी आपसे प्रार्थना या आप बोले या मैं बोलूं मेरी आपसे प्रार्थना है कि चारवाक को किस प्रकार का कष्ट दिया गया ये आप किसी इतिहास के आधार पर हमें बता दीजिए तो मैं आपके प्रश्न का उत्तर देने का या अपने विचार को सुधारने का दोनों प्रयत्न करने के लिए मैं तैयार आई एम ऑलवेज ओपन फॉर इलेक्ट्रिफिकेशन एंड करेक्शन तो कोई मुझे बता दे कि चारवाक के इतिहास में कहां यह मिला हुआ है या कम से कम आप स्वीकार करेंगे चारवाक को नहीं दिया गया कोई भी शारीरिक दंड बाद में हुआ मैं इस आक्षे से सहमत नहीं हूं कि चारवाक का इतिहास मिटा दिया गया है क्योंकि चारवाक को आप कृपा करके शांति से विचार कीजिए चारवाक को हम लोग बृहस्पति का अवतार मानते हैं और चारवाक के नास्तिकवादों के जो सिद्धांत हैं वो बराबर तब से आज तक चले आ रहे हैं और जहां तक मेरी भारतीय इतिहास की जानकारी है वहां तक चारवाक को या उनके अनुयायियों को जैसा कि मैंने कहा अंग्रेजी शिक्षा प्रणाली आने के पहले तक वैचारिक विरोध के आधार पर कोई उनको तकलीफ दी गई हो ऐसा मेरी जानकारी में आप तक नहीं है अगर आप प्रमाणों के साथ कोई बात दें तो मैं या तो उसका उत्तर दे सकूंगा या मैं अपने विचार सुधार सकूंगा मुझे इसमें कोई आपत्ति नहीं है अच्छा संभोग पर अगर आप चाहें द स्पीकर आई थिंक हैज मेड हिस्स स्टैंड क्वाइट क्लियर आई थिंक वी शुड गो फॉर अदर क्वेश्चन माई नेम इज जावेद आनंद आई एम फ्रॉम कम्युनिज्म कॉम्बैट Dr Nayak has said repeatedly that the punishment for any crime depends on the gravity of the crime and he has specifically talked about the American state and once about the Indian state and saying for treason if any official of the government of India employed by the government of India or any official employed by the government of the United States reveals the secrets of the states which compromise the integrity and so sovereignty of that state then he should be punished to death and is there anything wrong that or there has to be some uh, punishment that follows that is my impression i stand correct yes having said this he then proceeds to make the point that taslima nasreen for example he says that there are so many contradictory reports in various papers that he can come to no conclusion whatsoever maybe he is also in doubt as to whether any maulana has or has not passed a fatwa against the sriwan nasri but it seems to me that contained in that argument also is that if the sriwan nasri has said anything against the quran because that is her firm belief just as it is the firm belief of many other people that quran is the word of allah then she can be tried by numerous authorities including by dr zakir naik himself if the sriwan nasri were here today he will know her age he will know whether she is a gynecologist whether she believes in islam etc etc at the end of which he can pronounce some punishment for her which could also mean chopping off opposite limbs or uh, head or exile or those four options is given now if there are to be many centers of jurisdiction i mean many many people whether it's a mulla or a pandit or a shankaracharya or a pope or whatever it is who can simultaneously decide what crime for what punishment then i have a question i come from the district of allahabad from a village in allahabad where there's a mosque in which i have prayed for many many years during my years i know for a fact most of us muslims know for a fact as also the hindus of the village that in that mosque on the outer boundary there are statues which could only have come from some temple or another if some pandit from my village in allahabad decides that a temple a temple was destroyed here a few hundred years back or whatever it is and for that crime that pandit sitting in that village decides that the muslims of that village be killed and all the hindus killed all the muslims or as many muslims as they can is there something wrong with it is this what he suggested 
if he asks sir please repeat the question it is going to be very difficult <laughs> well i'll i'll summarize it can there be many many centers can there be many many centers of decision making in terms of what constitutes crime and what is punishment brother thank you for the short speech in your short speech you have asked at least 10 15 questions if not more whatever i can remember 